Hello and welcome to Addressing the COVID-19 Crisis, our weekly open forum for pharmacists. I'm Michael Hoag, Dean and Professor at Loma Linda University and the President of the American Pharmacists Association. We are delighted to have you joining us today for what is going to be a chock full packed uh, information session. Uh, this is on our hottest topic, the topic we receive more questions about than any other topic, which is testing. Uh, we're going to discuss pharmacy models for COVID-19 testing, successful approaches and implementation of those approaches, and how the pharmacist is engaged in testing. Now, we're not going to just be sharing with you a bunch of theories today, folks. We have with us two guests who are actively engaged in providing uh, COVID-19 testing. Uh, we're joined, first of all, by Eric Larson, who is the owner of Prescriptions Unlimited. Uh, his pharmacies are in St. Cloud, Florida, and uh, they have been responding to the COVID pandemic by working with the Osceola County Department of Health to provide drive-through and off-site testing to help uh, work uh, with the Department of Health and HHS. Uh, their pharmacy uh, provides bedside delivery and readmission prevention programs. They have on-site and off-site vaccination programs and transitions of care and adherence programs as well. In addition, we're joined by Jasmina uh, Bajojevic, and I apologize, Jasmina, that I have a little bit of trouble with your name. Uh, my, my apologies for that. She is the manager of operations at Walgreens, and Jasmina supports COVID-19 testing site uh, operations and works to engage the pharmacists in additional health testing opportunities uh, all the time, not just during COVID. She has spent most of her professional career at the Walgreens corporate offices in Deerfield. Now, as always, we have our staff subject matter experts that are also going to join us for the audience Q&A period. Uh, we have Dan Zlot, who's our Senior Vice President of Education and Business Development at APHA. Dan will be talking, taking your questions later on in the webinar about all things drug and vaccine related as it might relate to COVID-19, or if you just have any other clinical question about COVID-19, he'll be happy to take it. And also Mike, <clears throat> Mike Baxter is joining us, our Senior Director of Regulatory Policy at APHA, and he'll be sharing with us uh, updates from Capitol Hill and from Washington and the things that are going on there. And I will just give you a little bit of a teaser, folks, today. Uh, we will be sharing some late breaking news from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for you. You don't want to miss it. Hang on to your seat uh, because later in the program, after we finished our um, uh, uh, question and answer period, uh, we'll invite Ann Burns from APHA staff to share some pretty exciting news with you from CMS. And so uh, you got to be uh, got to be here in order to hear it. So we're hoping that you'll stick around for that. So we're really excited to have our two uh, guests with us today, Eric and Jasmina. Uh, Eric, I'd like to ask you to go ahead and activate your video. Uh, Jasmina, go ahead and unmute your line. Jasmina is going to be, oh, I think both of them are on video. So uh, go ahead and uh, uh, unmute your videos there so we can see you. And um, Eric, welcome to you. Jasmina, welcome to you. Thank you. Well, Eric, let's get started with you. Uh, could you just give uh, our uh, viewers a little bit of an overview of your practice? I kind of gave a little intro, but I'd like to get a little bit more of an overview of, of your pharmacy practice, your independent practice there in St. Cloud, Florida. Sure. Uh, we are a, um, we're a community pharmacy, um, but we have uh, really expanded our services and, and kind of innovated our practice to where we do a lot of um, uh, we do a lot of vaccinations all, on and off site. We work with our school district and large employers uh, for direct contracts for vaccinations and other services as well. Um, we also obviously are doing a lot of COVID testing. Um, we're going to be doing the point of care testing once that rule is written in the state of Florida very soon. Um, you know, deliveries, uh, adherence packaging, a, uh, medication management programs. And then we're also a member of the Flip the Pharmacy grant. Uh, through CPSN and NCPA. Um, so we were doing a lot of care planning. And then finally, we just received another grant and we work with a, um, the Indigent Health Clinic 
So uh, weekly, we are visiting with patients and doing medication management there in collaboration with their medical director. Uh, we can do, um, you know, drug dose changes. We work a lot with diabetes and, and hypertensive patients. And then finally, we just started a residency program. So we have a resident who just started here uh, July 1st. As so if you weren't busy one. enough with other things. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> so we're going for, uh, and we're going for accreditation this year. So Jasmina, give us a little more insight into the work that you do with Walgreens and the kinds of things that you oversee at Walgreens. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, as you had shared, I've spent most of my career up at the Walgreens support office. Um, this year, I am proud to uh, celebrate my 20 years with the company. Um, I have been in pharmacy operations um, for most of my career, spent some time in the retail and specialty locations. And um, my in my most recent experience, um, it's exciting, Eric, to hear all of the wonderful work you're doing at your pharmacy. Um, I was helping support our patient outcomes uh, performance work and any adherence programs we have across the chain. Uh, currently in my role, uh, ever since the pandemic started back in uh, March, um, I was pulled in uh, by, a, by a team here uh, to support operations. So essentially my work and my day-to-day -day, um, is to support end-to-end -end operations. So essentially working with internal and external stakeholders um, to help set up testing sites uh, across the country um, at select Walgreens locations. So where we are allowed to um, offer, you know, COVID testing, uh, we're also, you know, excited to offer both point of care testing and what we call a swab and send a collection model in partnership with the commercial laboratory. Um, so I'm also heavily um, participating with our government relations teams and our pharmacy affairs teams to work through um, expansion of scope for pharmacists to be providers of COVID-19 testing as well. That's great. That's very exciting. <clears throat> I'm going to ask the staff to bring up the next slide. As we begin our conversation, I want to remind our listeners that APHA has available at pharmacist.com on the COVID-19 resources, a uh, very helpful practice resource that talks about the different testing models that are out there. The, uh, you've already heard the term a couple of times, swab and send, and then you've also heard about point of care. And we're gonna talk about both of those models today. It's not that we're endorsing one model over the other as an approach. We want pharmacists to be involved. But if you want more nitty gritty detail about how to get involved in this, please go visit pharmacist.com and look at this practice resource. It will give you some follow up. Now, Eric, um, uh, we've got a couple of photos to show from your pharmacy. And um, I would wonder if as we pull these photos up, if you could use this as an opportunity to describe your swab and send model for us and, and what we're seeing here, okay? Sure, happy to. Um... So as you can see, uh, not really much, nothing fancy here about what we do. Uh, we converted our stock room and side door to our collection area. Um, we are very fortunate. It's kind of a natural fit. We had a drive. We don't have a drive through. They just have an alleyway in the side that's actually become our drive up testing um, pathway. So, you know, once we got started, we actually have two different contracts, one with the uh, Osceola County and then the other one's with HHS. So we have two different types of tests and the county one. Uh, actually, they rotate tests all the time in labs, so we're constantly using different types of tests in labs, you know, pretty regularly. Um, but what we have is, um, you know, pa patients will line up. We have some street signs, things like that, to show patients where to drive. Um, we had, we were not appointment only. We were walk-ins for a while, just to give you an idea. And then the city had to basically intervene and tell us that, you know, we had about 300 cars in line at one point. Uh, we were doing about 300, 350 per day for a while. Wow. Uh, and that was going on for about a month. Yeah, um, that's on site. And we were doing off site pods as the Department of Health deployed us out for pods in certain uh, certain areas as well. So wow. um, but this is now our this is now where we're doing all of our collection. And then every, um, you know, every night what we'll do is our drivers, our couriers is actually works out well. Take the samples to um, to the Department of Health or FedEx will pick up the samples that we ship to a different lab and then they'll replenish our supplies every night. But it, it's drive up only. Um, pace without vehicles will walk up on the side. There's a little pathway, so we do let them come up if they're on foot, you know, if they don't have a vehicle. Um, and that's kind of how it is. It just kind of wraps around the building and down the state street. So, um, Eric, just in follow up, what prompted you to become a CLIA waived uh, laboratory? 
uh, and uh, to enroll as a Medicare independent lab. What what prompted you to do this? Yeah, well, it, it kind of goes back to 2007, really, when I was working at independent pharmacies before. I've always had a CLIA waiver. Uh, we were doing the Cholestec back there in 2007. We were doing you know those types of services. So I've always had a CLIA waiver. I didn't know you could even do vaccines without one, to be honest. I just always had it. So um, we've had our CLIA waiver, and now we're evolving that into the, um, we just got our laboratory PTAN a couple months ago under the emergency order, and then we spoke to CMS yesterday, and they said there's going to be some um, follow-up to that when that emergency order expires for us to trans to basically convert our temporary PTAN into a permanent collection site PTAN. Um, so that, that's kind of where we've gone with it um, yeah. in that regard. Just to clarify that term PTAN, in case our listeners are not familiar, why do you need a PTAN? What is that? What is that about? Yeah, so that's your billing code for Medicare. That's your that's the number you need to know at all at all times for any Medicare. You know, your NPI is attached to a PTAN, right? There's so many numbers in pharmacy, it, it's mind blowing and confusing. But the PTAN is how Medicare um, and their clearinghouses identify you as a provider, so they can pay you because each region has different providers and different people that pay you so you have to have a PTAN and you'll have a PTAN for vaccine services I have a PTAN for DME and now I have a PTAN for lab collection so you're going to have multiple PTANs based on your service set all right so it's about getting paid and that's important and you know we've been fighting for that at the national level so that's an important thing to know now Jasmina I want to switch to you for just a moment um uh your point of care testing model is a little different than Eric's you're providing a different uh range of types of tests can you tell us about that yes um so uh, that lovely resource that you just shared uh I did share that internally with our with our pharma- pharmacy operations team because I felt like uh, there was a lot of information out there um and there's a there's a lot of confusion um and I, I do believe the CDC is also putting out some helpful resources to kind of outline the difference between point of care and a swab and send collection model. Um, we are lucky to offer both of those pharmacy models. Uh, we initially launched with a point of care uh, testing. Uh, we, we partnered with HHS in the beginning. They you know, had the public health um, officers on site to help us kind of get our, our feet steady. Um, and then we essentially partnered um, with Abbott to offer the ID Now uh, point of care test. Um, The way that, you know, everything that Eric mentioned about obtaining a CLIA certificate of waiver to be able to do so, um, all of that's important, and and we'll talk about that later in terms of the steps to be able to set up this type of of offering. Um, To our patients, it really made sense to start off with this, especially um, in late March um, when we were first setting up these locations. Everyone was very anxious and eager to find out whether or not they had COVID, and to be able to offer a point of care solution meant that our you know, patients could have results um, within that same day um, so that they you know, are armed with that information and can, and can make a decision on you know, what's the next steps to take care of themselves and, and obviously their loved ones. Um, in the pictures you see here, um, it is very different than, than what we're used to doing in pharmacy. And like I said, said spending so much time in uh, pharmacy, and, and being used to what happens inside of the building, setting up a testing event in the parking lot is, is very different. So obviously you'll see, uh, we were lucky to be able to, to leverage the drive-through that we have. We've been using stores that are both open locations and also stores that used to be Walgreens that are closed down, as you see this uh, picture on the screen. Uh, everything is set up uh, with you know uh, available signage to direct the vehicle traffic. Um, Eric, I hear you loud and clear, especially in our Florida locations as well, um, upwards of you know, 250 plus patients yeah. a day. It gets really busy. Um, it, is, it is a lot of, of hard work, but we have a lot of dedicated team members that are just passionate um, to serve their community. The picture on the right, you see a team member that's fully garbed and is actually actively processing a sample um, using one of those devices. Um, and like I said, our, our team members are able to provide those results um, within the same day. Jasmine, let me ask you a couple of questions based on the photos you've got there. I saw in the previous photos from Eric uh, that Eric was actually conducting one of those tests, it looked like. But uh, in the photo of the drive through I see two people in that photo, one sitting at a table and one standing, I assume, doing the test. Are either of those individuals pharmacists? So I see three people. One is in camouflage. That's why I couldn't see that person as well. Is, uh, <laughs> A pharmacist in that in, in that picture, or a pharmacist actively involved at Walgreens and in doing testing, or are these other folks that you've brought in? 
So we have um, uh, Walgreens pharmacy team members that can participate are both, you know, in terms of like, as we're talking about traffic control, things that we never thought we would be involved with, with offering a pharmacy service, traffic control, traffic flow management. So we have non-pharmacy team members that are supporting our testing sites. Um, the pharmacy team members, like a technician, obviously a pharmacist. We are also proud to say that this is a pharmacist led operation. Um, because everything that you see set up here, the patient is doing the self-swab collection. So they are using a nasal swab to collect the sample. A pharmacist is observing that occurring, not only so that they can verbally coach the patient through step-by-step -step on how to actually collect the sample in order to maintain you know, integrity of that sample and get a valid result, um, but they are also there to make sure that they're doing it correctly and answer any questions that the patient may have at the moment of uh, collection. So, you know, you bring up something, and I think, Erica, we've talked about this on a previous uh, discussion you and I've had. Um, there's two different kinds of uh, nasal swabs, really, that we see in use. One is a full nasopharyngeal swab where a person who's qualified to administer that swab inserts the swab uh, into the nasopharyngeal pharynx and uh, there's about a 30 second uh, turn time that has to occur in order to be able to collect that sample and have a valid sample uh, with that. But, but as Jasmina just said, there are also these self-administered swabs that don't go nearly as deeply into the nasopharynx. In other words, as uh, it doesn't feel like your eyeball is going to poke out uh, and which uh, right. that you can otherwise. So Eric, what, which of those kinds of tests are you doing at your pharmacy? Or are you doing both of those? I've done every kind of test. I feel like the Department of Health has switched it about three or four times on us. Uh, we have the self collection that we coach the patients to do on their own. We also have a the nasopharyngeal. We've done those, and we've been doing it. We had to do an oral swab for a long time. So um, a lot of our tests in the beginning were not self collection. Our pharmacists were out there doing. You know, we had two or three of us out there at a time doing these tests all day long. Um, but most were oral nasopharyngeal, and now the Department of Health has given us another uh, type of nasal swab, which is a, a, a it's not a self-test, but it's not nasopharyngeal. It's a very shallow swab, um, which is really nice and convenient, and it's only about a thir about a 10-second turn instead of that 30 seconds. So we're able to, to kind of move the cars out quicker. But, so I mean, we've probably gone through four or five different tests. So, Eric, I'll ask you this first, and then, Jasmine, the same question to you. How did you train yourself and your pharmacist to be able to do these different kinds of tests? How did you did the Department of Health provide you training? How did you how did you ensure that the pharmacists who were doing the testing knew what they were doing? Because yeah. most pharmacy schools have not yet integrated this kind of I think now they are integrating this into the curricula at most schools, but that wasn't the case not too long ago. So how do yeah, you do that? Right. Yeah, we um Department of Health came and trained us on each one of their tests. When they switched tests on us, they came out and trained us. Um, so we had training nice. modules and we had online uh, videos as well. Uh, as they, We do the video and then they'd come out and show us how to do it. And they'd spend the, uh, the first mornings with us. Okay. And Jasmina, what did Walgreens do? Um, so happy to also partner with um, Dan Slott and uh, APHA to build a clinical training module that basically, um, as we said, we started off with nasopharyngeal when, when HHS um, public health officers were kind of helping, you know, coach us through that. Um, and we went quickly from a nasopharyngeal, obviously, for everything we've already said, um, not only for the training, um, but also the patient experience. Um, we are lucky enough to partner with our uh, clinical office. So we have a variety of uh, healthcare professionals we work with. Um, so we trained our pharmacists. We also had a, an event medical supervisor who is a, a nurse practitioner. Um, we also partnered um, with the you know, chief medical officer of our company to put together and, and evaluate all the clinical materials. Um, we were able to train them on site. Um, at that time, knowing nasopharyngeal had to be full PPE. Um, we were there, you know, observing them and evaluating their technique. Um, obviously, we're excited when FDA approved a nasal self swab um, because then, you know, a pharmacist could coach a patient to do the uh, the uh, specimen collection themselves. So recently, we've heard a lot in the news about delays in getting results back from laboratories because. Uh, 
of such a huge volume of testing that's that's going on. Uh, could you just share with us, and I realize this is just a snapshot in time, if someone were to come to your pharmacy today, Eric, and get a nasal swab, how long would it be before they get their results? Three to five days. Okay, and Jasmine, is it any different in your pharmacies right now? Is that about the same for the nasopharyngeal swabs or the nasal swabs? So for the nasal swabs and the swab and send uh, model, it is not uh, drastically different from that. But again, um, and that's why I like to answer the question about the point of care. That was really, we yeah. emphasize point of care as that strategic decision um, well, to be able to give results quickly. Yeah, let's talk about the point of care testing. So if you're in a situation where you have multiple kinds of tests available, uh, you then need to make a decision about which one of the tests you're going to use and, and the results you're going to get, I'm assuming. So, so tell us about the point of care testing and when do you use the point of care testing versus the nasal swab? Is there a difference or what, what's your decision making process on that? Um, so obviously, first and foremost, it is a patient experience. And so when we select a site, um, obviously, again, you know, not only working with internal groups within Walgreens, but also validating all of our site selection with um, the administration, uh, we are looking at vulnerable patient populations. And when we do choose a site, um, that site only conducts that type of test. So it's not like the team member at the site is choosing one over the other. Um, okay. One location will do only point of care, and then a separate location will only do swab and send. Okay, that's good information to know. That's great. And and these point of care tests, just to be clear, you get a result within 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that? Yes, that is right. Um, the turnaround time, uh, we've heard so many stories where, I mean, there was a situation where patients driving home, they didn't even make it home yet, and they already got a phone call from one of our pharmacists. Um, with the result, and I said that that empowers them to then make those um, decisions and change behavior if they need to, um, depending obviously on the outcome of that result. Boy, and I tell you what, there's so much anxiety around uh, around COVID right now, and when people aren't sure what's going on, um, it really it really can be stressful for them. So I'm sure a quick turnaround is helpful. So uh, that that's very useful. Let me um, remind our audience that we will be happy to take your questions uh, for Eric and Jasmina. If you would type your questions into the question box, then I'll uh, be happy to take a look at your question and get you activated so you can ask your question. So for our audience members, uh, we will take your questions. There's two ways you can ask your question. One, type it into the question box. If you do not have audio capability because you're connected via a cell phone or a landline phone, uh, you can just say no audio and I'll ask your question for you. If, however, you would like to ask your question verbally, then uh, I'll call on you, we'll unmute your line, and then you'll be able to ask your question verbally. So go ahead and type in your questions as you have them. We'll be happy to take them as they come along. Now, Eric, I want to uh, ask uh, if, without divulging any patient confidentiality whatsoever, uh, do you have a particular success story you might want to share with us? So tell us about um, a win, a success that maybe occurred, and uh, Jasmina, you've got the, you're going to get the same question, so I'd, I'd like to hear both of you tell me about a big win that maybe happens uh, by doing testing. Yeah, mine, mine absolutely is a community response, 100%. Um, we've had, you know, partners from the fire department, the police, um, the municipalities, the school district, um, being able to be, uh, you know, uh, great patient access for them and being outreach to them has been the, the biggest win for us. Just being able to help the community out. Um, yeah. that's, that's the most rewarding thing. I, I can tell everyone this is the hardest thing we've ever done, but it's by far the best. I mean, regardless of the payment model and it, it's not about the profitability at this point, you know, um, I tell my staff, my students, you know, if we want to act, if we want to be providers, this is how you act like it. Yeah. Oh, no, that, what a great, uh, what a great, uh, point. Uh, that we, if we want to be considered as providers, we have to act first and then the payment will follow. And that's, that's really great. I, I love that. Jasmina, what are your, what are your successes, observations of successes? 
Well, um, as a pharmacist and as a mother of three, um, just being able to feel like I'm doing something, I'm contributing to the to the greater good, not only when you think about it, like at the local level, um, I was at the first site that we set up in Illinois. I was watching patients come through. I was seeing their reactions when they got results. Um, it really gave me goosebumps. I mean, there were people that came back and put up lawn signs in front of that location. Um, kids have sent us letters written in crayon um, thanking us that their parents are negative and that they can spend time with them. Um, but like from that local level as a, as a pharmacist, I'm thinking about parents, you know, that are taking care of their children or obviously um, as everyone was still in self quarantine, um, it's it just these touching stories that we hear are, are amazing. Um, and then at like a national level, when we think about all the locations that we have, I, I'm very proud to say that 70% of our locations are in socially vulnerable areas. So where the, you know, the, the CDC and where these statistics of cases are cropping up, that's exactly where we go. So it's very rewarding to know that we, we go where there is the most need. Yeah. Now I want to get to a very practical issue about payment. Um, pharmacists definitely need to do things because it's the right thing to do, but we have to expect to be treated equally in the healthcare system. Physicians can get paid, uh, their practices can get paid for doing COVID testing um, and, and the counseling that's associated with that. Laboratories are getting paid, but we have hit a wall uh, with, uh, with CMS in getting pharmacist recognized and paid for this testing. It seems highly unfair, uh, but I would like to just mention, ask each of you, and I, Jasmina, we'll start with you. Tell, tell us about how this has worked. I understand Walgreens has had a contract with HHS, so some contractual arrangements there uh, allow for some payment, but looking at it from a sustainability standpoint, where are we? So from a financial sustainability, um, I can't really speak to any specifics, but you hit the nail on the head. Um, and, and I know that Eric has also mentioned this. If we want to be recognized as providers, uh, we do need to act like ones and we need to be recognized for those. Not only the test itself or a product, as we've always been fighting for, it's also for that service. So as we talked about pharmacists counseling patients, it's not just the result, but it's also the additional training that we've received as pharmacists and our subject matter expertise to be able to provide to those patients, especially in this type of an emotional situation, as we said, um, that that skill set that we have as pharmacists until we're financially um, able to be recognized and reimbursed for that. Um, this this um, opportunity, if we want to look at the silver lining, I guess, in all of this, um, I look at it as a as a launching pad. Um, to to really just to further exemplify what pharmacists are capable of doing. Yeah. Eric, uh, uh, from my conversation with you, it sounds like uh, you're getting paid for the collection activity, but not for the counseling. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, my perspective is a little different um, because I have to actually run the business and, you know, I have all the, the bottom line to worry about as well and allocating my staff to do this every day. So, um, it's been quite a juggle for us. Um, we're, we are getting paid and um, we're working on a different type of payment model from, from the, uh, the county as well, going through the state and the governor's office. So we're working on a couple other things, but as far as sustainability to answer your question is, we can definitely sustain. Um, and the Department of Health has been helping us do that by providing us with all the, the PPE and basically you know, mitigating our costs. It's just labor at this point. Um, and you know the good news is they're buying PPE from us. So we're a contractor with the state of Florida. So they're buying the PPE from us and then just giving it right back to us. So it, you know, and they've kind of made we've made that arrangement together to kind of help you know keep us going until we get some type of payment model figured out. Well, that's good. Sometimes it does require some creativity at the local that's level, right. and I think one takeaway message for everybody might be to partner with your local and state health departments. That that really is a key important factor, and I see both of you nodding heads on that one. Uh, let me let me uh, call on an audience member here. We've got a question from Adrian Matson. Adrian, we're going to unmute your line and let you ask your question. Okay, I'll ask your question for you. Uh, the question Adrian asks, have either of the presenters started to think about how they will do COVID testing during flu season? 
do you plan to test for both COVID and flu at your locations, given that the symptoms overlap? Uh, Jasmina, you want to start uh, with that one? Yeah, um, and, and that is very uh, valid as we're talking about with all the um, uncertainty and just um, confusion around when the pandemic really ramped up. Um, that was that point in time in the springtime. And now as we start to enter the fall, um, it is it is very confusing for patients. As you said, the symptoms are, are going to overlap. So again, I feel like it's a farm. It's an opportunity for pharmacists to help um, clear up that confusion. Now, I know that there are um, tests as you know, FDA continues to, to release, you know, um, under the emergency use authorization, additional tests that will be able to test for both. Um, we are working very closely with uh, the immunization services team that we have at the support office to really put together a plan on how to um, help pharmacists clear up that confusion. Now, I can't speak to any specifics on whether we will be offering both tests, um, but do know that we are going to look at it. Uh, it, it kind of goes hand in hand as a, as a public health um, situation to, to best, you know, really put pharmacists forward and help, you know, counsel patients in that time of need. Eric, how about you? Are you going to do flu testing or are you doing uh, point of care flu testing? Yeah, we are. We're right now waiting on the rule uh, from the state of Florida. You know, we just passed that. That legislation just passed this recent session. So uh, right now the Board of Pharmacy is writing that rule. Um, we are appealing to them to include COVID testing once that rule is written uh, to have that done. So it's, it's going to be like a fast so we don't have to wait for legislation to pass again for COVID to be added to that for testing. Um, we are going to be doing it for sure uh, if it's available to us of course um, and as far as the vaccination piece um, you know we're, we're already going to we're already positioned to do the vaccinations we're going to be using the drive up as a drive up vaccination as well um, for our patients that don't want to come inside and and you know we already do off-site uh, vaccine clinics so you know we're pretty we're pretty set to mobilize for this that's great. Okay. Um, I've got a question here from Allison Toole, who does not have audio. Uh, she's asking how, how accurate are these different tests? And I think we've got a slide that I can pull up here um, about the concepts of sensitivity and specificity. And so, uh, in other words, uh, how, how uh, confident are you that when you get a positive, that you really have a positive? That's a sensitivity. And how confident that the negative that you got is truly a negative, that's specificity. And, um, uh, you know, I think there's been some, uh, you know, just different information in the media specifically about point of care devices and whether or not they're specific enough uh, to be able to have confidence that a negative is a negative. And so Jasmina, since you're administering that test uh, with Walgreens, Let's say you have a patient come in to uh, uh, your testing site for a point of care test uh, with the Abbott device and they're symptomatic. Let's say they have uh, the signs and symptoms of COVID are evident in the patient, but the test comes back negative. What in the world do you do with that? Again, um, it's, it's really why the pharmacist has that conversation to really be able to give that patient um, the, the appropriate recommendation on really next steps. Obviously, we do want them in all situations and any type of um, counseling that we provide, we want them to really connect with their you know, primary care provider um, to just oversee their, their overall situation. Um, but if you do get a negative test and yet you know the patient has symptoms they might be confused and not sure on what to do next so what we really do is our pharmacists follow that cdc guideline on recommendation for a follow-up test so if it is done at a, at a point of care location um, and it does warrant a follow-up at, at a location that is sent you know a sample that's sent off to a, a commercial laboratory um, it is something that we do recommend for our patients, and and it's pretty awesome that we have the opportunity and the ability and the ability to recommend both um, types of tests. Okay, um, uh, a question we had another uh, audience member doesn't have uh, audio available. Eric, um, how have the physicians in your area reacted to you doing testing? I mean, they've been really receptive. They send people to us. Um, you know, a lot of the physicians' offices have been sending their staff to get tested uh, when they present any type of symptoms, and also their patients. Um, you know, being that you know we are a, a 
quote unquote free, you know, type of testing center for any patient, regardless of insurance or not, because we're funded from federal and state. Um, that's kind of why everyone's just been coming to us. So, I mean, as far as the reaction goes, I get calls every day from physicians sending their patients here and their, and their staff. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. And, and in terms of communication with uh, the other healthcare providers involved in the care of a patient, I mean, Jasmine, if someone comes through your testing site, do they disclose who their primary care physician is to, to the Walgreens testers? And is there any follow-up there or is that not required as part of protocol? Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about when you get a positive test, who are you required to report that positive to and what's optional? Clarify that for all of us, Jasmina. Yeah, that's the, that's the fun of being at the support office level is getting that 50 state view of really, obviously, as we all know, um, the practice of pharmacy varies state by state. So um, bottom line, um, all of our results are communicated to HHS. Um, so they have a COVID responder, a responder dashboard. Um, obviously to maintain uh, surveillance data of the spread of COVID-19 across the country. So for all of the patients that come through any of our testing locations, um, all results, both positives and negatives, are communicated to HHS. Now, we do comply with all state-specific um, reporting uh, requirements. So that essentially goes to the, um, the State Department of Health, and then uh, the State Department of Health in turn communicates to the, the various counties within that state. Um, obviously, that uh, data, uh, prioritizing p uh, positive results, but we do communicate all. Um, they really act upon the positive results that they get from us in order to do the contact tracing um, and obviously, you know, try and their best to minimize the spread of the virus. And Eric, I assume that uh, because you're partnering with the Department of Health, there's a little more direct connection with the Department of Health uh, just naturally because of your arrangement. So is there anything substantively different with the way you do that reporting? No, sir. Um, we have specific collection or we have a specific patient intake forms we have to use to get all the data that we need. It has changed throughout time as they move to portal only uh, because the Department of Health just couldn't handle the call volume anymore. Um, but they report everything to, I believe it's called Merlin or something like that. Um, and that's the national database. And then, um, you know, we get, if we have to outreach to patients and their contacts, then we can do that. And uh, obviously here, I'm not going to ask you about specific payment amounts. Uh, that would be a, an antitrust violation. But what I want to ask you about is whether or not either of you are currently seeing favorable payment or being able to bill and get paid from third party payers that are not the government. So set aside CMS, Medicare, Medicaid programs, talking about self-insured employers and private healthcare plans. Are you billing them for testing now and are you able to get paid? Are they recognizing your claim and paying for the claim? In general, just speak to me in general terms, yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you want to start no, with no. that? I have not. Okay. Jasmina, what about with Walgreens? Any success there? Uh, we are actively working on it. Yeah. So that would be a no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all actively working on it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Eric, I do want to admit, uh, ask one more advocacy question of you because you obviously have been very involved in your community. Um, I understand you have a little bit of a story to tell about a congressperson who might have prompted you to get involved with COVID testing. Could you tell us that story? Uh, sure, yeah, that's actually how I got involved with it, to be honest with you. Um, so Congressman Darren Soto is a, a, a a person I've known for a long time since he's been in office. He's visited our pharmacy about four or five times. Um, and then our state representatives, um, Mike LaRosa and uh, Senator Torres, uh, our a local in our area, um, they're the ones that called me up and asked if I could help. Um, when they saw the emergency order come through by DeSantis, um, the state rep had reached out to me and asked me, you know, if we were interested in helping out the Department of Health because they were understaffed and didn't have an extension in the St. Cloud area. Uh, to provide testing. So that call from his chief of staff um, is how I got going with this. And then I met with the Department of Health right thereafter. Um, and then as far as that, that, then that kind of coordinated with, you know, our area. And then as far as the 
state representatives, they're the ones that are going to bat and, and getting payment for us right now. They're the ones that have been calling the governor's office, calling Department of Health, looking for CARES money to allocate for us to do this. So it sounds like uh, you would be a strong advocate for pharmacist advocacy, that they, that they need to be involved, huh? I live it every day. If you're not advocating for your profession, then you're not in the profession. Then. Well, that's a strong statement, but uh, cer certainly true. Uh, we've got a question for Dan Zlot. Dan, if you want to turn your video on for us, there have been some references to cross immunity to COVID-19 in the news recently. Can you explain what this is all about? What is this concept of cross immunity and, and what are we hearing about in the news? Sure, absolutely. Uh, that's a great question. So um, I, I'll ask for forgiveness in advance. Um, I spent 10 years working in immunology, so um, I'll keep it high level. Um, but really this boils down to the difference between the way that different components of our immune system work. So the two major components of our uh, adaptive immune response, our ability to learn new um, antigens that we can develop a response against and remember those so that the next time we see them, we have a more rapid and more potent response, uh, really is dependent on antibodies and T cells. So the two work a little bit differently. Antibodies are very large molecules, as we all know, and they tend to recognize large things. Uh, T cell receptors, the things that help T cells target, on the other hand, are much more specific. So they target little bits and pieces of um, antigens. So it turns out that um, most of the cross immunity that we're seeing, we think is occurring with T cells. And um, since we like to think of our immune system waging war against uh, microbes, I I'm gonna use a, an analogy. Um, so imagine if you will, that we have a tank that we wanna target. And uh, an antibody might recognize the entire shape of the tank and say, that's a tank, we need to destroy it. Whereas a T cell might focus in on a very specific component of a tank, like the treads of a tank, and say, oh, look, there's some treads that look like a tank, I'm gonna go and attack that. It turns out that there may be other things that have treads that aren't tanks, like construction equipment, right? Bulldozers and things like that. So uh, a T cell might get confused and see something that looks like a tread on a, on a bulldozer and go and attack that thinking it's a tank. And that's sort of the equivalent of what's happening with this cross immunity. So there are other coronaviruses and actually maybe even other things besides coronaviruses that our T cells are able to recognize. And they uh, then, if they see that similar pattern on something like uh, coronavirus, they go and attack it, even though they, uh, this is occurring in patients who have never actually seen coronavirus. So that's sort of a high level overview of what's going on and how that works. Wow. I tell you what, our bodies are amazing machines. They, uh, they do a lot, of, uh, a lot of interesting things. Well, we've got time for one more audience question. We're gonna unmute the line of Barry Bunting, who's gonna ask our final question for our guest speakers. Uh, Barry, your sound quality is poor. Um, probably going to have to have staff and re mute your mind, and I'll ask you okay. a question. Sorry about that. Um, that. Is there any concern with the accuracy of tests? Uh, I mean, you've seen multiple tests coming through that you're being provided, Eric. Uh, Jasmine, you mentioned multiple different kinds of tests. Uh, are you concerned about any of those things? And do you take that into consideration, test accuracy, when you're uh, both conducting the test and when you're communicating results to patients? Do you tell patients um, you're negative and we're 70% certain that that's a real negative? Or do, how, what is that, where does that come into play in, in all of your decision making? Jasmina, why don't you go first? Yeah, um, when you say uh, I am 70% accurate, um, I think about just being trained as a pharmacist and, and if you pulled out the package insert and started to, you know, quote um, actual data, um, I think you might maybe scare the patient away. Um, honestly, when we look at the different tests that we offer, and even to be very honest, when we look at all of the potential partners that have approached Walgreens, we will always look at really what's the intended use of that test. So in, in partners that we've chosen and tests that we've chosen to offer, 
we do look at what is the intended use, what did they get approval for, and really how are we going to use that. Again, it goes back to our clinical training of our pharmacists, and even beyond the clinical training of, of maybe how to use a device, for example, uh, for our point of care tests, or uh, maintaining sample integrity with our swab and send model. Um, also look at the operational training. Are they, are they you know, using appropriate PPE to minimize any potential cross-contamination? Um, are they following the workflow that we trained them on? Are they physically, did they set up their space um, to maintain and, and de, you know, decontaminate after every patient sample that they process? So all of those things come into play um, when we do train our staff so that they are you know, utilizing the tests the way that they were intended to be used. And then obviously the, the pharmacist being trained on how to communicate those results, giving the patient the information that they need, and then you know, referring out if they need to or giving them follow-up steps um, if, let's say, their clinical picture doesn't match their results. Yeah. Eric, any additional thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree with basically everything Yasmina said. Um, I think for us, it's, you know, there's a lot of unknowns with testing and accuracy out there right now. Um, you know, we, we hang our hat on the fact that we're using you know, state approved, federal approved type tests, you know, that's really all we can really tell them, the patients. But I think for us, it goes to making sure that we're doing our job the best and then leaving the testing accuracy in the hands of the actual lab. So, you know, kind of like Yasmina mentioned, we just want to make sure we're out there coaching the patients and making sure they're actually, especially on the self test, on um, the ones we administer, then, you know, we're doing, um, you know, updates and, and, and training regularly. But the self collection, we want to make sure that we're coaching them to get that accurate result. I will mention that we don't even get paid unless it's an act, a processed result. So if it comes back, um, like collection not able to be done or the, the lab it, unable to process it, we don't get paid. So, which is, I'm okay with that. It's incentivized based, you know, testing. So we want to make sure we're doing it the right way and collecting the best sample possible. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, Jasmina Bijegovic, thank you so much for joining us. Eric Larson, thank you for sharing your wisdom as well. Uh, this has been a fantastic program. We're so excited to get this information. Dan, thank you for sharing the clinical information with us. I am now going to uh, uh, actually ask our audience to respond to a poll. We haven't done our poll question this week. So we're going to get some feedback from our audience on which testing model below best describes how your pharmacy is providing these services currently. Are you using swab and send in partnership with the lab? Are you using a point of care device or are you doing both uh, similar to what Walgreens just described? Or is your practice embedded in a physician's practice or are you still interested in providing tests but maybe not currently providing? So if we could get all of you to please vote and give us your information, gives us a snapshot in time about where we're at currently with our listeners and testing. So let's uh, please everybody just take a moment and click right there on your screen. It's a pretty simple process. We wanna get as many of you to vote as we possibly can. So we'll have a valid sample size here. Since we're talking about samples, we want to have a valid sample size on our poll today too. All right, let's put up the results. And uh, it looks like that uh, nearly three quarters of you are not currently providing COVID testing, but are very interested in doing so. And we have a smattering of folks across the other options that we had. So thank you all for responding to that. Now I'm going to uh, uh, ask our guests to uh, deactivate their cameras. And Ann Burns, we're going to call on you to share uh, some late breaking news from CMS with us. So Ann. Great. Thank you, Michael. And great. There's the slide. Um, just quickly have some exciting news to share uh, that we learned yesterday from CMS. Uh, this applies directly to accredited pharmacies who are offering diabetes self-management training uh, programs or services to patients. And it really, uh, this it's a clarification in a frequently asked questions document that APHA and other organizations have been asking CMS for for months. So we were very excited to see this clarification. Basically what it means is that if you are a Medicare enrolled DSMT 
pharmacy provider, you can now offer your services via telehealth which is extremely important because these services are often group classes. They also can be individual, but in the, in the age of COVID, bringing people together in a room to offer very important diabetes services is not a good idea. And so we were very excited to see this clarification. Um, I would like to note that APHA worked very closely with the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. Many of you know this organization as AADE. They've recently changed their name. Um, would also, lots of folks worked on this, but I'd like to call out member Starlin Hayden Grading, who has done an inordinate amount of work uh, to help raise awareness. Uh, so if anyone has uh, questions about that, please feel free to contact us at APHA, uh, but we're very excited to see this win. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Baxter to talk more about some of our other advocacy efforts. Great, okay, well, uh, thank you, Anne, and uh, thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, in our updates on previous webinars and today, uh, we've kept our members up to date with the most relevant flexibilities extended to pharmacists by the federal government. Uh, to address the COVID-19 crisis. There are a number of them, um, including the ability of pharmacists to order and conduct counseling and treatment for critical diseases uh, like COVID-19, uh, the ability of pharmacists and pharmacy technicians with valid license to operate across state lines, uh, pharmacists and pharmacy staff conducting routine pharmacy tasks uh, remotely as necessary, including those that are licensed outside the state, uh, health plans flexibility around prior authorization protocols, refills, deliveries, uh, pharmacy audits, and signature log flexibility, uh, telehealth flexibility, as Dan just mentioned, for DSMT billing for accredited pharmacies and virtual supervision of pharmacists uh, by physicians for incident two services such as medication management and remote patient monitoring. And flexibility to compound medications and shortages at hospitals uh, without patient prescriptions. Um, you know, many of these authorities, however, are, are actually scheduled to expire um, if we ever end the public health emergency for COVID-19. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 has really exposed a number of gaps in the healthcare system um, that are hampered by a number of regulatory burdens on pharmacists. As you may also know, the president is very focused on reopening states and their economies and issued an executive order instructing the federal regulatory agencies to recommend which flexibilities that were granted to address COVID-19 should be made permanent. Uh, to that extent, APHA recently banded together with the other leading national pharmacy organizations send a letter to the HHS secretary to make all the current flexibilities granted to pharmacists permanent and to expand upon them if the federal government really wants to reopen this country safely. I'm um, stressed that pharmacists are a key to helping Americans get back to work. Uh, we plan to continue to work with the other pharmacy colleagues to keep up the pressure on the federal government to ensure pharmacists can continue to meet the challenge of COVID-19 and future public health emergencies uh, because we all know that there are likely to be more challenges in the future. Um, and now I'm gonna actually turn it back over to Michael Hogue on the next slide to urge you to help with our fight in Congress on the legislative front. Well, thanks, Mike, appreciate the update. Now, as all of you who are regular participants in the webinar know, we have been asking for weeks for uh, each of you to advocate with your members of Congress through taking action at the pharmacist.com take action uh, site. And many of you have done that, but I'm going to make a special plea with each of you today. As many of you are aware from the media reports, the Senate and House have uh, had some difficulties with their talks on the HEALS Act and talks have stalled on the HEALS Act. Um, we need uh, especially uh, the, uh, all of you to contact your senators. Now, both the House and the Senate are important. That's very important. But the Senate Finance Committee in particular is really influential in making the decisions about what's going to go into the HEALS Act and how we're going to get uh, potentially recognized. And we need pharmacists to reach out to their senators, in particular, making phone calls to the senator's office and uh, demanding as a constituent that they uh, allow coverage for pharmacists provided COVID uh, and flu testing as well as COVID vaccine. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the constituents of these legislators. They work for us, not the other way around. And sometimes they get confused about that. And I realize that I'm being a little bit uh, strong on this, but we've got to have pharmacists calling in. 
Um, APHA is working tough. All of the pharmacy associations are working tough day in and day out from the association standpoint to make this advocacy, but nothing is more powerful than an individual constituent who calls a member's office and tells them, I expect you to support my profession and support this vote. Please, 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 if you do nothing else today uh, beyond this webinar, please pick up the phone and call your senators and let them know that you expect them to cover this, uh, to, to include this act in the uh, HEALS Act. And, and also promote these letters. The Action Center is still there. We need letters to go through the Action Center to members of Congress in both sides of the aisle. But I'm pleading with you to please take additional action today. Even if you've never done that before, take time to do it today. And if you need their phone number, just go to pharmacist.com and look on the Take Action website, your uh, webpage. You'll see all the information you need to either call your member of Congress or to write your member of Congress we could really use your help on that. Now, uh, I'm going to turn it over quickly to Dan Slott, who's going to share some information about education with you. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. And I'll just add on really quickly. I've used the Legislative Action Center, and it's super easy to use. Um, definitely encourage everybody to go check that out. So uh, moving back to coronavirus and our APHA's resources. APHA staff, as you know, has been creating tons and tons of resources, and we created so many resources, it was time for a website redesign to make it easier to find the resources that we've created. So we have reorganized everything uh, in two different ways, one based on topics, that's what you see here, whether you're looking for information on testing, medications being studied, immunizations, telehealth, et cetera. Um, all of our resources, both the practice resources and the education resources, uh, are found by topic here. And, and if we go to the next slide, we also have them grouped by resource type. So if you're looking for the practice resources, if you're looking for more information on the 15 on COVID-19 series, or looking for where all of the past uh, weekly webinars that we've done are, you can find all that information there grouped by type of resource. Um, and again, just to highlight again, there's that APHA advocacy piece. Definitely check that out. Um, see what APHA has been doing and become part of our advocacy efforts to ensure that pharmacists get provider status. Next slide, please. Um, and as you know, a uh, topic <laughs> near and dear to my heart, uh, the 15 on COVID-19 series, uh, we continue to produce those for you as often as we can. And so uh, we've got those now organized in one spot, easy to find, and hopefully a little bit clearer for you in terms of the topic and the date that they were released. Uh, so do check those out. Michael, I'll turn it back to you. I just want to remind everyone that uh, APHA members can engage with each other through our Engage platform. Um, we do have a COVID-19 uh, page there where you can share ideas and strategies of things you're doing in practice. Uh, we do ask that all of you please seriously consider joining APHA. Uh, if you're not a member currently, we need you on the team and in the game uh, helping us move these agendas forward. Now, next week, we have a very important and exciting program. Please share this with all of your friends and let them know we are going to have a discussion about vaccine safety. Now, there's a lot of information in the news about COVID-19 vaccine and pharmacists and pharmacy technicians on the front line will inevitably be asked lots of questions about safety. And there's going to be a lot of misinformation in the news about vaccine safety. We're excited to have a guest from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention who heads up their vaccine safety work uh, sharing with us. And we have a physician who's heading up one of the large clinical trials of COVID vaccine that will be joining us to talk to us about the vaccine clinical trials. And vaccine safety is gonna be the topic that we're gonna discuss next week. Two of the nation's leading experts on vaccine safety will be joining us on our webinar next week. You will not want to miss this, and you will want to make sure that your colleagues are well aware that we're going to have this conversation. So we will see you next week, same day, same time, same place, right here uh, on the COVID-19 APHA webinar series. Thank you for all that you do for the profession and all that you do for the, for the patients in your community. Have a great week. God bless.